Sheldon School is a mixed comprehensive, currently about 1,750 students on roll. Uh, we're a fully inclusive school, so we have children of all um, abilities, including um, SEN, a hearing impaired unit on site. We are a fully inclusive sixth form as well. We have currently about 360 students who can get into our sixth form having got five grade fours at GCSE. And do you have a strong maths element to your sixth form? Many maths, students has, taking maths? maths has been a, a traditionally strong subject um, here. Um, we've had up to 50 or 60 at, uh, at some points doing A-level maths um, and results have been generally very strong. Okay, and how many teachers in your maths department? There are 14 teachers yeah. in the maths department, is that They're about right? Including you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, if you include me that yeah. is. Yeah. Okay, so that's important that we know you're a maths specialist as well, so know a bit about teaching for mastery perhaps. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. So I'm looking at this school, I had a look at the website and it looks like a very high performing school and it has been for a while, is, is that correct? That's true. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, so what I'm wondering is why teaching for mastery? There's often a thing I think with high performing schools of if it's not bro broke don't fix it, so why are you wanting to make these changes do you think? It was important for me when I came to the school seven years ago that the focus for us was on quality first teaching and what's going on in the classroom. Um, and ever since, we've always been looking at how we could improve things in all of our subjects. And of course, when mastery was talked about within the maths curriculum, it was an obvious opportunity really to, to find out more about it and to get involved. And uh, already we're delighted with how things have moved on from that. Right, okay. Um, so Nicola, can you tell me what appealed to you about teaching for mastery and how you got involved to begin with? Um, yeah, I've just always loved learning and I always think there's always room to improve your teaching. And so um, when I started at the school just over four years ago was just when kind of the information about mastery was starting to come out. Um, I saw some adverts for people saying you could come and watch lessons um, and start to get involved. So I went to Balcarra School when some of the teachers were over from Shanghai and saw a lesson in practice. Um, and then gradually I just became more and more involved as working groups got set up in terms of sharing ideas, watching um, lessons and building it and bringing that back to our department. Um, and then last year was the first time we were more formally involved um, through the Mastery Advocate Programme, where a mastery specialist um, from Balcaris, Pippa Baker, um, was linked with us as a school um, and we were part of a, a wider group um, going to observe Pippa, planning stuff together and then also Pippa coming to work with us here as a team um, observe some of our teaching and help us with our planning as well. Okay can you give us a bit of an idea of the sort of time commitment that that involved? Um, uh, so in, informally it was just like the odd afternoon um, visiting another school um, over the last year as the Master Advocate Programme we um, it was timetabled roughly six half days over the year where we went to Balcaris three times to observe lessons and, and be part of a working group there. And then Pippa came here three times to observe lessons and work with us here. And, and that then was you and another teacher. Myself yeah. and a colleague who were the two mastery advocates. Um, and that included then towards the end of last year an afternoon of the whole department of timetable to really sit, reflect on where we'd come so far over the year um, and, and do some planning, co-planning of units together. Right, and was that with the mastery specialist as well? Yes, with yeah. Pippa as well, yeah. Okay. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how you've um, transmitted what you've learnt with Pippa and your colleague to the rest of your department because you've got a big department haven't you? Mm. So Yeah so gone? I mean the prime place we've used is department meetings over the last we have department meetings once every uh, at least once every four weeks and so using um, part of department meeting time when we're all together to share um, ideas that we found share things that we were trying. Um, Zahid and I tried to trial things in our classrooms that we'd that we'd um, learnt about um, from Pippa, trialled them in our classroom and then would share kind of what we'd experienced um, with the rest of the department and people were very on board with that. Uh, we've also been willing to open our door to the department for, to come and watch lessons um, and as we've built better resources for kind of units of work, share that with the department to be able to utilise shared resources. If you're spending more of your department meetings talking about pedagogy and planning lessons and collaborating, where do you fit in the admin? <laughs> We've got a lot more organised recently at sending stuff out um, by email to know in advance um, and just trying to tighten up on, yeah. on that side of things. Meetings should not be for administration. Yeah. That, that can be dealt with in other ways. Meetings should be talking about the students 
and quality first teaching. So can you tell me if I walked into a year seven lesson now, which I did this morning, actually, it was lovely to see um, how how that lesson looks different to what it might have looked like a couple of years ago? I think that there is a lot more discussion going on. There's a lot more energy around kind of um, using the right language around the mathematics. Um, a lot more interactive, a lot more use of whiteboards, a lot more discussion going on. Um, but also a, a slower pace that doesn't feel slow, but where we, you know, the, one of the big things for us with the mastery that we've taken away from, from the mastery programme is a small focus per lesson and really drilling down onto something very specific and looking into that in depth where it may feel like we haven't made a huge amount of progress in terms of the curriculum, but we have done lots um, lots of depth and really understanding the topic in lots of looking at the topic in lots of different ways. Mm. Um, and have you seen differences in classrooms that you've been into? I have in um, in a number of places. I think it's something that will continue to work its way through. Um, so obviously our younger students are perhaps more receptive uh, than the ones that have been um, working in a different way. But even in my own year 11 class, you know, we, we've been we've been trialing things and going much more deeper into topics than, than we might have done in the past rather than quickly skirting on. And um, so I think there are benefits right the way up, including into A level. Mm, interesting. I think that's an important point with year seven. They're very receptive because our prime, local primary schools have been more on board <coughs> with these kind of things mm. that you see that it feels very natural for them to come into the type, we, type of lessons we're doing with year seven now. Um, which is lovely to see and we've just introduced the new, a new scheme of work, we've introduced the white rose math scheme of work which lots of them have followed at primary school anyway so it feels very natural for them that the step to secondary school maths isn't a big leap for them Right. and the lessons hopefully feel very familiar for them. Do you have many feeder schools? Yeah we have uh, nearly 40 Right. Okay. so getting out to all of them is an impossibility but yeah. we, are, we do work closely with, with a large number of them. And do you have a sense for the sort of proportion of them that are doing teaching for mastery now? Is that a bit difficult to tell, but maybe from your year seven classes? I think of the larger ones, a good chunk of them are. Right. Definitely, I think well, there's some bigger feeder schools, but it's, it's not certainly not across all of them. Yeah. No, okay. So um, can you give us an idea of, you un started to understand more and more about teaching for mastery, you decided you wanted to implement some of the ideas here. Where did you start? <laughs> <laughs> It's been uh, very slow because it isn't something you can change overnight. I definitely think it's it's been drip, trying to drip feed things in through through meetings. So, for example, the the Glow Math Hub that we work closely with introduced um, an acronym Mindset, um, of which kind of that's kind of like seven components that they felt made up lessons that that would come across like uh, as teaching for mastery. Um, and so we just tried to pick focus uh, pick a different focus each term to focus on. Right. Um, and so implementing different ideas. So, for example, um, using more true or false questions, we would discuss that at a department meeting and just try and encourage everyone to roll those out into more of their lessons and come back and feedback on what they'd found and what kind of discussions they were having. And then drip feeding other things like intelligent practice and variation theory. And again, then focusing on planning some um, question sets together that followed intelligent practice and seeing how that went. And it's just been a very slow process to kind of implement step by step because you can't do everything at once um, elements of that that people are slowly becoming more uh, integral to their lessons on a regular basis. Did you start in all year groups or did you start just with year seven? Uh, this year is the first year we've start, we've fully gone ahead with it with year seven I think it's not been a year group in particular over the last few years it's just been as a, a topic or a unit of work has been something where we felt like we had lots of ideas for that we've it's been we've planned a unit of work for year 10 or a, pla a unit of work for year eight where we felt like we had some strong ideas and we, we had time to sit together and co-plan those those things so it's not been a year group in particular it's more been a unit of work where we've had the time to really do it fully across the whole unit over a few weeks worth of lessons right but this year have you changed uh, my understanding right that you've changed this scheme of work with year seven yes so year right. seven this year we've um, implemented the white rose scheme uh, white rose math scheme of work okay um, so, uh, can you explain how the how the staff have responded to these changes? Have they all been positive? Have you had any any um, naysayers? I think in, initially, I, as um, initially, some people felt like it sounded like, well, that's just how we teach anyway. Um, 
And so initially people thought, well, what, what extra are you trying to add? But when we really started to, to delve into it, people could see how, how much better the lessons were if you implemented all these things. Um, and particularly the slower, um, slowing down a smaller focus per lesson. At first, I think people were reluctant, maybe with the, the highest attaining students, feeling like the lessons would be too slow. And there was an element of reluctance there. But I hope that we've started to show how, with your top set, we've started to show how um, you can have a really small focus each lesson and, and go into lots of depth and really get some amazing discussion out of mm. it as well. Mm. Have you been surprised by that, Neil? I have a little. and I've been teaching a bit longer than Nicola. And um, yeah, it, it's been really refreshing to reflect on my own practice and um, come back at things and look at things in different ways. And, and actually the students do actually enjoy it because they're becoming even more confident with their mathematics. You know, they're, they're working with it in different ways and um, it is worth spending that time on it. Right. Were, were you initially worried they might get bored? There's always that worry with higher ability students. Um, so you've still got to plan it thoroughly and, and think very carefully um, because, yes, if you're, you've got a small focus, you can't do, you've got to think very carefully about how you're working with that focus. Um, but um, certainly the students have enjoyed the challenge and, and when they can actually see the benefit of it, then, then, then they're prepared to run with it, I think. Right, okay. Can I just add in yeah, that? Yeah, I know I um, some other colleagues have said with, with those kind of students, actually, at first, it was the students more reluctant to um, articulate their thinking more um, and have a go at if, if, if things they weren't sure of because they're so used to finding maths quite easy and they mm. were actually more challenged. And, and whilst initially they were reluctant to it, now they enjoy it because they are feeling more challenged where they have to um, articulate their thinking more, where they have to show multiple ways of thinking about something for them is more challenging than just getting to the right answer. Um, and that's another way that they've actually come around to feeling more challenged by that. But they found that difficult at first. Interesting. OK, and what about um, other sorts of pupil response? Have, have all the pupils responded positively to it? We've talked about how the high attainers have responded. What about the other students? I think, I mean, I've taught lots of uh, middle attaining groups over the last few years, and I felt that they've been really proud about how they've been able to access, when I said, you know, this is talk about kind of what type of topic it is and how hard a topic it is, particularly at GCSE, they've been really proud that they've actually been able to access something by going slowly through it by, by using careful variation, um, that they've been able to access these topics and, and get a really strong grasp of them. I think we've still probably got work to do, I think, at, with the, the lowest attaining students, mm. um, and there's still a bit of work there to make sure that they are getting the most out of it, um, I think, for them. The slower pace is always good and a small focus per lesson, but I think there's more that we could do there. Right. And have you been surprised by how much these students have managed to attain? You talk about your middle attainers mm. being surprised by what they can do. Yeah, definitely. And I think just by stepping back, going through slowly um, and using definitely things like, you know, intelligent questioning to show how things kind of are, are linked to each other. They've been able to see connections more than, I, than I've previously noticed and they're feeling more confident. And also by regularly getting uh, more unusual and unfamiliar questions in there sooner, they are less thrown when they come across more unusual questions in exam papers because they're used to us immediately showing them lots of unusual things related to something rather than always just showing them the simplest type of question to do with a certain topic. Mm. Okay, can I ask you now about um, the sort of structural changes that you might have had to make? Um, so we've changed, our, as we said, we've changed our scheme of work in year seven because we feel that that then gives us a scheme of work that allows uh, these small <coughs> steps and everything to build on nicely. Um, in the other year groups, we've definitely accepted that you're not always going to get through our, we haven't changed our schemes of work yet, we will food feed that through, but we have accepted that there are certain topics we may have to say, we're going to leave that this year until next year so that we can allow more time on other things and we've come together as a department to agree those things. Um, we've talked about department meetings um, and making more use of those yeah. as a kind of planning time and, and using our PPA time together more. Um, the other thing I think, yeah, in terms of manipulatives is something going forward, I think is something we'd definitely be more interested in making more use of to, to support, I mean, all, all levels of students, because I know it could be helpful for all levels, but I think particularly lowest attaining that might add an extra thing going forward. Okay, Neil, can I ask you about uh, the sort of structural changes you might have had to make at school level as well? What, what sort of, 
What sort of allowances have you had to make <coughs> to we, implement this? Yeah, we haven't had to do anything structurally that, that wasn't in place before, but obviously we need to be supporting um, CPD and time out of school, which I'm happy to do. Um, we have um, a very wide programme of training for our staff anyway, right across our subjects. Um, and this certainly fitted into that category. So um, giving Nicola and Zahid the opportunity to go out to uh, other schools, to give them the time to have Pippa coming in to talk to them and work with them and plan with them. You know, that was time very well invested. Um, and I even went out myself to um, one of the, the final meetings just to hear from other colleagues that had been involved. You know, it's fascinating to, to, to hear their stories as well. Um, so I guess there was the, the, um, the commitment on our part was really time, afternoons, odd days out of school in order to uh, get the most out of the, out of the programme. And was the funding helpful with that? Absolutely. I think yeah. without any funding, we wouldn't have been able to have um, committed to quite the time that went out. But even though the funding isn't there this year, we will still want them to continue that dialogue and continue that networking um, at certain points during the year because uh, having got it going and getting, getting it going so well, you don't want it just to suddenly stop and fall away because I think it will be important to, to con continue those conversations. Mm. Do you want to talk about your um, teacher peer mentoring? I don't know if you call it that scheme that you've got because I think that's quite unique and I think <coughs> the from what I've heard this morning, it sounds like the need to collaborate with other teachers that Teaching for Mastery brings fits in quite nicely to what you've already got established here. So I was talking about the co-coaching programme that yeah. you know is, is part of our CPD and part mm -hmm. linked link to our inset programme where every year you uh, are encouraged, required, um, you want to work with a colleague. And so, for example, last year I worked with a colleague in the maths department and we used our co-coaching time to plan a sequence of lessons together, to observe each other teaching those lessons, to feed back to each other and refine those lessons. Um, and that made a massive difference to the quality of those lessons by having that time to do that. And that's a really lovely thing as part of the co-coaching programme, as part of our wider yeah. CPD, that really gives you a really strong focus on what happens in your classroom. And, and we have had um, teachers working across faculties in other areas of the school where there might be quite a close link between your subject areas. You know, maths and science is an obvious one, but you, you'll see it in the humanities as well. But actually, again, for this year, we're focusing with colleagues within their own uh, faculties, working together, planning, looking at similar ability students and what works in one lesson as opposed to what works in another and, and getting that dialogue going with our teachers here. And how much time does that, how much time commitment is there to that? <clears throat> in total, um, you would probably, it would probably equate to about one half a day's um, training in set time over the course of the year. So we would allocate that um, as appropriate throughout the year. Right, okay. And so has that helped with the, with, dispersing teaching for mastery amongst the department. Yes, definitely. Yeah, it's made a massive difference for the teachers to be able to plan together and actually observe those lessons mm. with each other and then take the time to reflect off the back of those observations and improve those lessons going forward. And then, you know, with 14 teachers, if that's six or seven pairs of teachers doing that on different topics, to be able to share that back mm. into the department as a massive um, improvement on our resources and our shared resources together. OK. Um, I want to pick up on something you talked about, Neil, when you were saying that you, you'd gone to a meeting with lots of other schools. Did you pick up ideas from other schools? How, how, and also, Nicola, you might have something to say here. How was it working with other schools? What did that offer you that you might not have got otherwise? I'll start. I think for, for me, it was more the, the overview and what um, senior teachers, head teachers were, were saying about what was happening in their schools as reported by teachers that were, were at that meeting. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've obviously got a, a special interest because I'm a maths teacher myself and I still teach and I don't always teach the, the higher ability ones either. So I'm, I'm fascinated at how, how it works with, with all abilities. So, so for me going in as a maths teacher and hearing what, uh, what other colleagues were doing in different contexts, I, I thought was, was really important. Um, I think probably Nicola would have picked up more 
more of the specifics and, and the, the, the things that were working really well and what might apply to us perhaps more than I did. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, no, no, definitely got loads of ideas of how people have implemented things. And it's, it's, it's interesting the different, um, slightly different focus people have had, but they've taken away because obviously it is, it's not just a tiny thing, Master. It's quite a big, broad thing. And, and the different schools have, have had a different focus and implemented certain aspects of it more than us. And then we've implemented other aspects more than them, I feel. Um, I really enjoyed listening to one of the schools just talking about the, the language they use in Lesson More and the real focus on using really strong mathematical language and probing questions more and just asking why more and kind of really pushing the students to articulate really clear answers and full sentence answers as uh, something I want to try and implement a little bit more here. Right. Uh, where do you see it going this year and then beyond that? What, what do you see your next focus as being? Yeah, so I think the focus this year is really making sure we implement it really well in year seven with a new scheme of work and make sure all our resources and the, the, the type of thing that's happening, the discussions that are happening in our lessons really reflect all the ideas we've been working on over the last few years. Um, and then over the years, hopefully we can roll that forward into year eight and year nine, and then eventually into GCSE. What I was just saying there about um, the language we use in lessons, so I think everyone has focused more on using correct mathematical language, but maybe something about um, how students answer with full sentences more to try and Im embed a bit more. Um, and as I said before, manipulatives, I think is something, the next thing I'd really like to look at in detail to see whether that could really enhance and support our student learning more. Yeah. Neil, do you see any, is there anything in teaching for mastery that makes you think, oh, that might work nicely in other departments, in other subjects? Mm. That's had, had implications That's across an interesting school. one. Yeah. Um, well, I think the very fact that we're sort of drilling down and, and having these conversations in maths, um, I actually think that, that some of those elements are happening in, in other subjects anyway. Um, you know, and I think our humanities faculty is, is a good example of, of how they've really, they have really over the last few years um, sort of gone into sort of some, some detail with, within their own curriculum. But it, it makes sense. So yes, I can see that you, you could apply it um, right across the piece. Interestingly, as part of our CPD, a re you know, becoming more of a research informed school over the last couple of years, part of CPD programme last year was talking about cognitive overload and not overwhelming the students and it, and it aligned so nicely with the idea of just trying to do a little bit less per lesson but do it really well and get the students to understand it really well and actually that was part of a whole school focus as well. I also had a French teacher come and watch me and she said interestingly the, the questioning and the, the slight changes in all the questions through variation in intelligent practice was something that in languages is really closely linked and we had a bit of a discussion there about how we could support each other there right, a bit more yeah. as well. Interesting. Okay, it's 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 obviously very early days in your in in your school in terms of teaching for mastery, so I, I'm not going to ask you about have your GCSE results changed or anything like that. But is there anything tangible that you can grasp onto where you might be able to say that a group achieved something that you weren't expecting or something like that that you would put down to teaching for mastery, or is it really too early to say? I would say it's probably too early to say. Obviously, we will hope that it will translate into. Um, even better outcomes in due course. Um, but the outcomes is just one measure. Um, I think it, the, the students themselves being excited about mathematics, um, the fact that the, the atmosphere is one, is one of enthusiasm, that they're talking about it, that they're enjoying their mathematics, that they're becoming more confident with their mathematics. I think those are really important things and you can see that already with with the students that you've got lower down the school that, that are working through it. And of course, if that continues, then they will do very well, um, ultimately. Yeah, OK. Um, have you got a message for other head teachers that might be considering taking on teaching for mastery and are a bit unsure about it? Uh, there's nothing to worry about. Um, <laughs> you, you, it, it's been really interesting, exciting working with this programme last year. It's something that we're going to continue doing. Um, it, it will make a difference ultimately for the young people. And Nicola, have you got any message for um, other maths departments? Yeah, I think I'd agree. I'd just echo all of that. that it's really exciting. It's really nice to be in a department now where, you, where you're, all, all you're talking about is pedagogy and teaching and what's happening in your classroom is a really nice uh, working environment to be in. I think it's really positive for you know, retention and recruitment as well mm. in terms of being a kind of school and a kind of department that are really interested in always moving forward in their teaching 
um, and also also looking to always support each other through through these ideas as well. And there's some real tangible support out there to help you with that. Um, and working with with um, the the Maths Hub and working with Glow and working with Pippa has been just a really amazing experience over the last couple of years.